Welcome, Danelle. Uh, great to have you with us. So I'll go ahead and start off with just a brief introduction. And then um, as people come online, they can tune in. Also want to say up front, if you have any questions at any point, um, we definitely want to take questions throughout the webinar. So don't hold your questions until the end. Um, you can chat us, you can raise your hand, we'll be paying attention to all the Zoom functions. So um, however you want to get our attention, um, we'll be checking in to make sure we see any of your questions. Um, you can also pipe up if you have something urgent. Um, but now it is my pleasure to um, kind of turn things over and really give you guys a full overview of OTM's organization design solution. Um, where did it come from? How did we develop it? What is it made up of? Why does it work? Um, this is, you know, a, a methodology that's been created over 30 years. And so um, we really wanted to share some of the background info. Um, and so I will go ahead and hand it off to Mark Lascola. Thanks, Reagan. Um, it's good to see familiar names, friends, colleagues, and faces. Jilly, Danelle, good to see you both. Um, if you want to turn your camera on, you certainly can. And if you want to uh, ask questions, we would prefer you ask questions all along the way. Um, and you can either verbally ask them um, by unmuting yourself, um, or you can type them in the chat, uh, whichever way makes sense for you. So we'd like to keep this informal. We have 90 minutes. If we don't go that long, we don't need to. We're also willing to hang out with you afterwards or have uh, deeper conversations about anything that we cover. So um, I'm assuming, but just to check, everybody can see my screen. Is that correct? Um, um, so uh, let me first uh, be um, introduce my our newest OTM consultant and colleague. We're delighted to have um, Chris. Uh, join on the mark and um, and actually uh, have them on this webinar with me. So, Chris, why don't you take a few minutes and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, so, newest member of, of OTM, um, although more recently I've been told I can't use the new guy card anymore. Um, you can only use that for um, for six weeks, apparently. So, um, but but I feel deeply immersed in now, which is great. Um, I, I joined on the mark um, uh, back in uh, the summer. Uh, I've got a, a fairly substantial background in all things organization design and, and development. Uh, started my career out on the manufacturing lines, um, producing donuts. Um, uh, other donut brands are available, but I did start my career out with Krispy Kreme uh, here in the UK. Um, and it's a perspective I never lose touch of in terms of doing this work from two perspectives. One, there's always an opportunity to improve what we do. Um, but I guess as I've learned to make those improvements and changes, it impacts something else elsewhere in the in an organization and never truer in a manufacturing context is that. And, and second, um, going back to my manufacturing days, nothing pleased me more than to have people in Krispy Kreme come down to my manufacturing site and say, Chris, what do you think about? and ask for my opinion. So those two things I think have stayed with me for a very long time. Why I like doing this work is involvement of as many people as possible because there's so many good wisdoms and, and experience out in organizations. So I'm in, enjoying my time at, uh, at On The Mark so far and I'm willing to be uh, asked lots of questions today. Uh, maybe there's a key test in there to see if I pass the uh, the 10 questions of, um, uh, of On The Mark, but uh, delighted to meet everybody today. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to unleash Jilly's uh, genius on you on this and let her just ask you those questions. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Mark Lascola. I'm Chris, Chris's colleague, as well as a few others on the call from on the mark. So Jeremy, Reagan, Aaron um, and others who are on the call from on the mark. <clears throat> and uh, I'm I've been here a long time to start the business about 32 years ago, and it's it's a, it's a delight st to still be here and do this uh, do this webinar with you. Uh, when um, those of you who may know that on the mark has uh, a few years back, we created an or organization design app and took our solution and put it in an app. Um, and um, and since then, we've been thinking about, okay, is that, is that the epitome? Is that what do we continue to do? Do we continue to invest in that? 
Um, also, um, uh, there's been a lot of questions about how do we update it, um, and when do we next update our solution. So really this webinar is kind of a culmination of uh, where we're at, the, the newest evolution, and, and uh, we can talk about those things in detail with you. I do want to remind everyone that um, we are starting to pull the curtain out a little bit from behind, um, from, from Oz, if you will, and um, that this is a, a lot of what you're going to be seeing is our intellectual property um, and we appreciate you treating that with the respect um, that it deserves. Um, with that said, is we're going to talk about um, how I got into org design and and really some of the what I consider the gurus or masters doing this work, and how it's embedded uh, in uh, in our organization design solution, and the principles behind that. Um, I want you to also understand what science. Um, that we have in that in our solution, and then and then what makes our solution comprehensive, holistic, collaborative, and integrated. Um, and then we'll also then end up talking about um, access to on the marks uh, solution. Um, we'll talk about why we chose the uh, channel that we did, um, and go from there. So this is the overview. We're in the OTM background here. Next, Chris is going to take a minute and just talk about on the mark, um, and then we'll get into the substance of things. So, Chris, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to read every word on this slide, um, but I just thought maybe a couple of little stories. Um, again, just based on uh, maybe there's a little bit of a selfish view here, which um, I wouldn't mind adding a story to, which is what pulled me to on the mark. Because I think some of these um, bullet points have, have a, um, a big a, a big sense of meaning, certainly to me me personally, and, and things that actually the team are really proud of. Um, you know, the first one is um, we we choose to really specialize in all things operating model related, um, and, and that is a big choice. And we've learned to refine that over over a long time, as as Mark's described. And I I really appreciate that. I've spent some time in a bigger consultancy and. Uh, and that offers um, access to lots of different expertise, um, but there's nothing like being part of something really focused. Um, and you, there's an element of trust in terms of knowing that uh, the OTM team um, and what they can offer people is is, is in that real focus point around um, operating model modernizations. Um, 35 countries isn't a bad statistic. Um, you know, 450 projects, I think what we're starting to, to really do and have done over the over a number of years is is cross pollinate between those projects and really as Mark will describe later on um, not leave a solution that's 10 15 years old it's constantly updated based on everything we learn um, from applying it as well as you know other sources which which Mark will describe as well um, Mark will go into a lot more detail later uh, around how comprehensive um, holistic um, and integrated this solution is. Again, one thing I've learned to really appreciate in the last couple of months is, is the point about how integrated it is, how the design work isn't then followed by a whole uh, great bucket of change work. Um, and then you think about all the other things that happen in an organization when it comes to change projects. There always seems to be more than 100 change projects that happen in any organization, no matter how uh, small or, or large it is. So how we really bring all of that in and integrate it within the solution, I think is quite impressive. So I'll not steal Mark's thunder um, or a phrase we use in the UK is not steal sandwiches, um, but I'll stick to the one that says we won't steal his thunder. Mark, you can um, bring that one to life later around comprehensive, holistic uh, and integrated. Um, the thing I'm, I'm right into uh, three big redesigns at the moment with three um, clients. There's, there's one thing that I feel most proud about and it's the third point around um, how you drive real change through what I call real collaboration. So not just heading out into an organization, asking 10, 15 interview-based questions, coming back with the information and trying to make sense of it. This is getting a really diverse mix of people from an organization into a room to say, you own the process, you've got the wisdom, um, and we guide that team through it. So we'll bring to life a few examples a little bit later on about what we mean by um, by collaboration. And I think the same point around um, focusing on 
heads and hearts and commitment, not compliance. We'll, we'll cover that a bit later as well, is what does that really mean from a commitment, not a compliance point of view? And this really talks to the heart of um, both bottom up and top down change um, and, and making sure that there's a that there's a good balance, there's a rich balance. I personally, in my experience, don't think there's an either or in there. You do need top down leadership when it comes to you know, an end to end operating model redesign strategy has its place. The leadership team have a role to play and a responsibility to play, but they've got to tap the wisdom of the crowd, as we say. So that's where the, the bottom up piece will, will, will come in and we'll, we'll describe it a little bit later. Anything else, Chris, you want to say about on the mark? Uh, I think this, I think the, the one around results, Mark, if we could just skip back, I think this is quite interesting when you come to how do I know where to start a redesign? And probably a question even before that is, how do I even know when it's time to redesign? You know, you'll hear, you know, employee engagement is an interesting reference point in terms of how many people are engaged or not in the organization. But I think it goes deeper in terms of as you work your way around the organization and ask people what it's like to work here, um, the things that you most enjoy, the things that you least enjoy. We've certainly noticed a pattern around the level of effort it takes to deliver value to customers, the level of duplication there might be, the amount of rework in an organization, but also the level of clarity that teams have or don't have around what the organization is trying to do strategically. And the things on the right talk about some really key measures that, that, um, that we take away from, from our projects in terms of some of the typical numbers that we'd look at after a redesign. Um, 25% capacity release, I think is pretty impressive. If you can get an, a redesign right, then what we're saying there is typically we're releasing 25% of capacity for a, for a client's organization. And you can choose what you do with that capacity release. Do you, do you bank it as savings? Because some people's drivers for change on a redesign is to uh, become more efficient and there's a cost driver. Or do you choose to take that capacity release and re reinvest it in, in other areas? So these are just talking to some... Um, some key measures that that we take from from uh, from a lot of the redesigns. Before uh, before we go forward, if you don't mind, thanks, Chris. I, I do want to say that we um, the expectation by everybody on the on the Mark team is to give back to to our field, and you're going to see why this is important a little bit uh, in a little bit. But hopefully. Hopefully for those of you who, who value kind of staying informed, staying up to date in practices, some kind of certification, um, those things are important to us. And it's also important to give back. And it also feeds, you'll see, um, our continuing evolution of our solutions. Um, and, um, and so our relationships with these professional industry groups, as well as um, universities are very important for us um, in terms of feeding us and making sure that we're staying challenged and, and seeing things differently. Um, before I go forward, um, any questions that you would like us or uh, that you would like us to answer in advance? So maybe you'd want to just state it in the chat or verbally um, uh, state it. Um, feel free. We'll we'll give kind of a, a some space here for you just to what would be useful for us to cover as we start to go through this. Anything from anyone? Maybe they'll have questions once once we dive in. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, that pregnant pause, as we call it here in in uh, in the U.S. All right, well, let's move on. There, um, there is one question, sorry, that just popped up as you were saying that, Mark. Um, so Danelle is asking, what are some key strategic KPIs that should be considered? Ah, uh, good, good, um, um, Danelle. Let me let me kind of get into comprehensive integrated, and we will come back to that if you don't mind. But it's a really good question. I will say this, Danelle, as as um, uh, there are impact 
uh, KPIs, those that the things that you want to make a difference on. And then there's process KPI, which is, um, are we doing what we said we're going to do? So as you're, as uh, I approach that topic, be, I'm going to give you a handful of KPIs that are both process and impact. I, I think leaders are most often interested in impact, um, but sometimes the impact is a bit delayed. It might be a bit of a lagging indicator or, or um, in some cases, it, uh, it may not be lagging, just the opposite of that, but, um, but we'll come back to it, particularly when it comes to redesign work. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history um, through this story here, but I'm going to keep it really simple. Uh, my first encounter with this work was the mid to late 80s. Um, and at that point in time, between 1987 and um, the early to mid 90s, I really had, um, uh, uh, if you will, thrown myself into the work of those who were doing this work. And one of the things you'll notice about some of the authors um, uh, and the names here is a lot of these come from the social sciences in, uh, in clinical work or what we, might, what we might call therapy or clinical work. So, for example, uh, Virginia Satir, um, uh, uh, Gregory Bateson, Jay Haley were all um, at their, at their time were masters in, in family therapy and looking at human systems completely differently than, than your traditional Freudian um, type of analysts. And actually I have my master's degree in, in, a, in, a, in, in, this, in this field of work. Um, and it plays a big part in our design work. And I'll share with you in just a little bit why that's important. But you're gonna, you're gonna see here that early on in this, in, in, for me in the 80s, um, in early 90s, it was influenced by a lot of the work, but a lot of the influence comes from social sciences um, and less so from the business. Although I will share with you probably more than anything, and, and for those of you who know me, um, working in the schema of, of, of social technical systems and the STS work is profound in its impact. Um, and there are some fundamental principles in the STS doing design work in the STS world um, that um, is core to who I am and what I believe as a human being. Um, and the same with Fred and Marilyn Emery. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a little bit. And if you want to ask any questions about books or readings or things like that, um, I'm more than happy to uh, to point you in directions or talk more about each of their work. Um, so I'm going to just keep moving on um, unless I hear otherwise. Um, some of the principles that are now embedded in the on the mark methodology include things like people support what they help create. Um, it, it's what creates sustainability and stickiness. Um, um, but the way we do that work uh, is different than maybe your traditional consulting firms, and we'll come back to that. Uh, another principle is nothing really changes until behavior changes. Um, and one of the things, the wisdoms that we have is patterns die hard, and it's certainly been borne out by the last 20 years of neuroscience and the research on neuroscience and what sticks with people the other principle is in design work that is key is you have to make one decision at a time. It's really difficult for executive teams to make one decision at a time and typically get totally wrapped around the axle by trying to solve uh, or what we typically call eat an elephant all at the same time. And so then they get totally um, uh, undone or, or beat down, if you will, by trying to take on too many decisions at once. So one of the things about really good design work is you just have to make one decision. And then each decision sets up another set of challenges that have to be worked through and resolved and then a decision made. The other one, um, which uh, goes back to social sciences, is puzzle learning. Look, it's simply this, that all of us together working on an issue 
the solution's going to be stronger and more robust, and we're going to have a better idea, and we're going to have more of a complete picture than any one of us. And that holds true uh, across the three now, um, you know, across the 30 years of doing this work. Um, no one person, I don't care how much they make or how powerful they are, really has an idea of, the, of, of to the extent a problem resides or how complicated or complex a problem is. The importance of inclusion and diversity. Um, uh, I don't think anything more needs to be said there, but it, it, the more diversity you have looking at a problem, the stronger the solution. Um, Chris said this earlier, work is not a democracy, but that doesn't mean that everything has to be compliance based. That you have to, uh, as a leader, I think it's incumbent upon leaders to find opportunities for people to have some control over what it is they do and how they do it. Um, and, and that's again been borne out by the neuroscience as well. Another one, your customers are the most important. So we call this outside in thinking versus uh, what I, um, you might find this funny, you may not find it funny, but I call belly button thinking or inside out thinking. Many of, many of the redesigns get focused on what we want to do versus what our customers think is value. And what is that value? And then how does that value get translated into what work needs to be done to deliver that value? Um, and our whole methodology is focused on outside in. Um, uh, um, because if you don't have customers, you may not have a business. These next two um, is a subject of a journal article that I've been working on, um, on lateral thinking and doing and systems thinking and doing. Our workplaces are plagued with functional programmatic thinking. Um, and if you want any proof of that, look at how M&A work is done by the large consulting houses where they have leadership, they'll have org design as a separate work stream, they'll have um, other elements. And when you look at it, actually in totality, it's all just an organization design. Um, and so um, my point here is that leaders in an organization and people in an organization learn to think about what their patch is and they think vertically and they think functionally. Uh, when, when you're doing design work, it's incumbent upon you to think end to end and laterally. Um, uh, and and, and uh, Jilly has heard this, and some of you have heard this before, is doing design work, um, particularly as an internal, you have to be a free radical and you can't be burdened by worrying about who you report to and having to get permission to do everything every time you need to go see a leader that's two or three levels above your boss. Um, so the lateral thinking in doing and systems thinking is key in this work. Um, Commitment-based change is fastest. Um, Compliance-based change is fast at first, but actually will cost you more um, to get it done. So telling people what to do seems like it, it's an easy thing. Um, there's a place for it, but it's overused. And another principle is most businesses are way overcomplicated. And the reason they're way overcomplicated uh, is because of the lateral, uh, uh, the functional and programmatic thinking. Um, and um, so these principles are embedded in our design solution. Before I move forward, any, any kind of comments, questions? Uh, Reagan, Chris, are you seeing anything you want to add? Um, Mark, maybe just one, which I think to uh, a couple of your earlier points on the previous slide, um, you know, we talk about work is not a democracy and people support what they help to create. There's, I've learned to appreciate there's a big difference in the, in the question of do I feel heard versus do I agree? So, you know, involving large amounts of people in a redesign process doesn't, doesn't in itself create bureaucracy. And I think that's one of the sort of um, perceptions that I've tried to bust in doing this work is what we're not saying is by involving people, which has a key mechanism of engagement and involvement, but by involving them doesn't mean to slow down the process, providing that you've got a real solid set of social principles that say um, not everything can be done by, by consensus, um, but we do want to involve as many people as possible. So I just wanted to add that in to bring a couple of principles to life, particularly around that, that difference between 
um, do I agree versus, you know, do I feel heard? Here's a summary of kind of the evolution of our org design solution. It's not important that you see each one of these, um, but my first redesign experience was in 1987. Um, I was watching a consulting firm uh, do this work. And um, we, I first authored OTM's org design solution in 93. And since then, it's gone through five, six, seven evolutions um, and updates. And we're now just finishing up uh, the most recent update as well. Um, and these are just some of the milestones over the 30 years. Um, and it's funny looking at this, it's almost like I can go back there in a nanosecond um, uh, in terms of um, remembering what it was like or, or what have you. So let's keep moving. Um, I want to talk about the science uh, uh, and emerging uh, evidence-based practices and where it comes from. Um, the social sciences, I think, is probably pretty clear. Uh, 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 going back to the, uh, some of the master's influences on me and the work and the org design work, but it's also in the last 10 years, the work in neuroscience has just been unbelievable in terms of the human experience in the workplace. Um, and um, if you're not familiar with any of that work, we have some references for you. But but that has, that has I think, given uh, evidence to um, some of the things that we were learning back uh, 30 years ago. So for example, I think of one of the HBR articles back in the 90s on the uh, employee customer profit chain. I don't know if anyone, and then they did a second iteration on that uh, in the early 2000s. Um, another, another one is the uh, a Human Sigma uh, article also in HBR. And a lot of these started to connect uh, the, the, the worker and leader's experience in the organization and the impact on customers and the in impact on human experience. And, and since then, it's just, it's just uh, blossomed. Um, one of the things that we stay pretty up to speed on is constantly reading journals uh, relative to our industry. And for, in specific, I wanted to call out the Journal of Organization Design. And if you're not familiar with that, we can point you in that direction. But it's basically published by Springer um, uh, um, through what's called the Organization Design Community. Um, we, uh, Chris and the On The Mark team, get a handful of curated content on a monthly basis um, through the professional organizations that we're part of. Um, there's, a, there's a global committee that screens uh, content, uh, org design content being put out and published, and we get five to seven, maybe five to seven articles a month that we get to read. Um, and one of the things that we do is we pick, we pick through that to say, so what does this practically mean? Does that impact our work? Are we doing those things? Are we not doing those things? Um, we have deep participation and involvement uh, with many of the organization um, uh, design professional industries, which are listed there on, on your right-hand side. Um, it's also what's very important in terms of science is uh, collaboration theory and collaborative methods. Um, doing this work in the way that we do it really requires a very um, uh, uh, strong grounding in both facilitation skills and collaboration methods, uh, which are based on um, uh, uh, on evidence-based practices. And of course, friends and colleagues, and, and I think of the work, Jilly, uh, as I'm staring at your face, I think of all the, the, the experiences that we've been through, friends, colleagues, customers, how much they've fed our organization design solution. Um, and it would be remiss for me if I didn't talk about OTM colleagues, either past or present, and those who have come through on the mark, um, how much they've contributed to our collective know-how has really just been um, just priceless. Um, here's, a, here's a little bit uh, of worthwhile readings uh, if you want, uh, and, and again, Reagan's uh, might have mentioned or did mention that we'll make this available when we're done. So if you wanna, you wanna take these and 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 read some of these, um, again, a lot of our a lot of this work is embedded in in the way we do our work. Um, here's an example of an article: Why it's so hard to be fair. Um, uh, again, something that we, you can pull out 
really substantive, pragmatic nuggets of how do we do our work. Hey, Mark. Uh, go ahead, Chris. I just want to offer a, an observation. If you go back a couple of slides to the reading list, the, the, the thing I really appreciate about this work is if you look down the list of books and you try and find the word organization design, it, it's not in the list. And, and I, you know, I, I think it's really worth calling out around why, um, as Jilly, you put that there's so much wisdoms within this um, approach because there's such an emphasis on the social aspect of, of doing the change work, not as we say in OTM, the technical work, which is coming up with the design, you know, relatively speaking, coming up with a, a fit for purpose design on paper, it's pretty easy, but doing it with a the group of people that, well, you know, I know. Um, yeah, yeah, but easier. With, <laughs> easier with, with a, with, with a, the, the harder, the much harder thing is taking people on the journey, right? And, and I think that's the, the, there's a wisdom in this list in itself, which is um, it's not necessarily about the theory of, 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 of design. There's, there's a sort of a deep route to, um, to the social sciences and, and thinking about that human connection you mentioned earlier on. Well, and, and, and it goes back to is uh, our, until I guess our workplaces are nothing but AI and technology, it still has to be done by people, right? So we're still at this place as, um, and I'm a firm believer that technology is not going to save us from ourselves is that it's really about um, how do we adjust and renew and uh, adjust who we are and our behaviors and, and our uh, and our and how we see things in the world. And I think you have to um, uh, well, it's embedded in our methodology is you have you have to bring people along and people have to do the change simultaneously uh, with the change, the technical change. Any other comments, questions before we keep moving? So here's an example of, uh, to illustrate in a little bit more detail is, uh, what, what we've learned from all the work and changes, top-down compliance-based change sets the conditions for failure. So if you think about, um, if you think about telling people there's a place to tell, um, and and um, and I, I think it has its value, but again, it's it, um, compliance-based change has a limit in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, of its stickiness and the difference that it ultimately is going to make. And and um, what we've seen in the literature is reluctance and resistance. You remember, uh, you remember that uh, that we talked about. Oh, people are, are resistant to change. What we find is that the resistance to change is actually more related to how you approach change rather than the change itself. And top-down compliance-based change immediately creates resistance. So in the 80s, uh, we, you know, people were talking about, well, you know, the resistance to change is natural. Um, we're of the attitude is that people are maybe reluctant but let's not set them up to be resistant from the get-go and and if and if they're part of the solution that resistance um, uh, tends to melt away so an example of science uh, pay now pay later um, and just Danelle, this gets to your earlier question of one of the metrics that we look at is um, what's the metric of how quickly we can get to stabilizing a new operating model um, and what we found is that if you take a poll approach to change or commitment-based approach to change, that you can you're, you're, you can implement more quickly, which means that you're in the new model more quickly. Or uh, technology solutions, a perfect example, um, is, is you do heavier uh, socialization up front, you allow people to get their hands dirty play with it, make it their own, be part of the solution. It helps to create momentum into the implementation and then, and then cuts implementation down, time down by as much as 25% versus a more push approach or compliance-based change. Um, and so one of the questions we always ask a set of leaders is how quickly do you want to be in the new model? How quickly do you want that change in place? Um, 
and it's one of the one of the measures. And a little later, Danelle, I'm going to show you some measures that we process measures that tell us are we stabilizing the new change and stabilizing the new model that might be of interest to you. Um, that's relative to are we stabilizing or are we still in the middle of a model of a middle uh, of a change. An example is um, there's three reasons redesigns uh, projects fail. Three really big reasons. There's lots of other smaller reasons, but three big reasons. Uh, one of the the third reason is poor implementation. And the reason we talk about poor implementation is leaders get to a place where they've done the concept design work and they immediately think they can throw people into new into roles and jobs and things will magically then stabilize. And what we typically find is when that happens, you go in 18 months, two years later, and people are still struggling and they've defaulted back into old ways of working um, because that's what we do as human beings. So when we're not sure what to do, we default to what we know, um, a la patterns die hard. So one of the one of the metrics that we encourage leaders to take on, and Chris, I'm going to plant the seed for you in, in, the, in the project that we were uh, we were just in um, a week ago. Maybe you can talk some of the metrics for Danelle, um, give her a couple examples of what that customer is putting as metrics, uh, impact metrics in terms of the redesign. But that's something, Danelle, in terms of measuring uh, is important, I think, in terms of how quickly we get into implementation and how quickly we stabilize into the new operating model. And this is specific to redesign, but you could apply it to really any kind of a change. And just quickly, Mark, um, if you could go back one slide and maybe say a little more about the limited leadership capacity. Yes, I can. Um, the number one predictor for successful transformations, as identified by the AQPC, the American uh, Productivity Quality Center, um, which is a best practice clearinghouse. And I, I, I think they go by APQC now because they're not just American, they're global. It, the number one predictor of successful transformations of any sort, whether it's technology or anything else, is leadership involvement, active involvement from start to finish. What typically happens with compliance-based kind of changes, a leader announces a change and then you don't hear from them, him or her again. Um, which is a major mistake. So uh, with any change, you have to kind of keep pressure on. Um, you won't have to keep it visible. Um, you have to keep building relevance, help the organization build relevance and make connections. Um, and so the waning, um, the waning part is basically um, leaders moving on to something else, thinking it's all taken care of. I think that, Mark, that links back to your point you made on the, on the, on the slide that we skipped on to is the temptation once because typically the senior leadership team have lived the early parts of the design process and they feel like they're so immersed into it. The, the, the final answer, the implemented answer feels quite close. And I think there's a disappreciation to, but if we, if we lift ourselves up out of, who is in the, the design team, which for us is typically, you know, 40, 50 people. There is a huge amount of other people in the organization that could have no idea about what's been going on. So the question is, when does the change work sort of start? There's a choice, you know, do you, do you start that change work socially in the organization right at the very beginning? Or is there a degree of sort of working things out, finding clarity and alignment that's required in the leadership team, but constantly helping the leadership team to realize that, they might be quite close and aligned on their, you know, their operating model answer now. But there's two things. There's a significant amount of, of sort of, of detailed design work still to be done. But then there's this also, um, you know, volume of people, I guess, in the organization that, that uh, we sort of need to take a step back and, and, and bring up to speed, if you like. Julia, I was actually thinking of your team who you, you've trained in organization design, had trained in organization design. I think one of the things to your comment I'm thinking about is in, in, in your business, 
part of their job is making sure that the leader stays engaged in whatever design work's going on and not just from the beginning, right? It's all the way through. So they're both supporting, educating and informing, but also encouraging them. Um, you had your hand up, so keep going. Did you want to ask something? Well, I think observation and ask all at the same time, because I think there's just so much in those three words. So I think there's the leader walking away and thinking they've sponsored it. I think there's the leader doing what you described, which is forgetting to stay involved and just thinking it's happened. But I read limited leadership capacity, and maybe it's my bad, as the ability to even recognise or notice in the very first instance the, the whole connectivity of needing to even look at the org design and how hard it can be for us as professionals to even to be able to play it in in the first place because of perhaps their limited, if you go social science on it, their, their neurodiversity, their awareness of you know, their own EQ. You're so, that's, uh, so I was just thinking there's so much in that. That's right. Well, you are so um, all over it. So I'm just going to give you a practical example. I'm going to make some generalizations here is many leaders got to the place that they had by getting things done. And by having some expertise in some part of the business that they're that they're in. One of the things that we look at when we look at a leader is their ability to grasp more systemically, just the thing that you're mentioning, which is what is an operating model? How does it all fit together? Can they think beyond functional thinking? Can they see the whole picture? The other one is their emotional intelligence is do they have the emotional capacity to even take into account the things that they're asking the organization to do? Um, and so the way you've read it is exactly correct. It's all those things. There was another hand up I saw, so I want to make sure that we captured that. I saw another hand up somewhere. Wilson. Wilson. Hi. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's Wilson. Hi, so, Wilson. Good to see you again, Mark, and thanks for all the help. I mean, quite uh, amazing how you have uh, committed your your time and expertise to help uh, most of us who have been part of. Thank you very much. So I, I want to the, the if you have a situation where uh, the change seemingly is looking like a compliance-based change uh, from the top, and you are at certain location trying to manage, you already know the mix-up has come, the mistake has come, and you need to still manage that change and ensure that uh, you achieve success. Do you, I mean, how do you manage things like that? Right, we know the compliance-based change is it's, uh, it's a recipe for failure, but however, you already have it, uh, something, the mistake has been made, maybe from the global team or Yeah, so Wilson, um... And, and, and I really appreciate your question because there is a place for compliance based change. So the key then, if you're one of the, the things level that you were not part of, and you needed to manage that. Can you hear me, Wilson? Okay. okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Wilson, I, I think the a couple things you've mentioned that are, 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 are quite good. The first thing is, is that look at the change that's coming and saying, is there an opportunity? Is it all compliance that we just need to uh, uh, conform to this change? And if so, what you then need to do is plan it out for more change work to help people comply. So there has to be with compliance based change, you have to put in much stronger consequence management, um, um, if you will, carrot and, and, and stick. Uh, kinds of change consequences for people who are not complying. And my other suggestion is get really clear about what compliance looks like from a behavioral perspective and hold all the leaders accountable for that um, um, uh, across the business who's ever affected by those changes. Um, so you're really going to have to pull on the strength of your leadership, um, of your leadership. And you're really going to have to hold them accountable 
and you really have to then build in uh, what I would call more traditional approaches to change management, um, which includes carrot and stick uh, types of consequences for compliance or non-compliance. Mark, there's a sort of an additional practical Sorry, Wilson, you come back in. Go back no, on. it's good. It's, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to offer a, a, an additional point to what Mark had described there. I come from quite an operational background um, and, and worked in industry as an internal practitioner for a while. And to echo Mark's point about if we follow the trail about how leaders got into the position they got into, there is a route. I typically find which is back to the operational role that they fulfilled. And yes, if, you know, compliance-based change, as Mark says, it will always have its place and there will be some leaders that, that want to push forward and in some contexts have to push forward in terms of urgency of wanting to make the change. But there's a real practical part that I've always used, which is trying to help the leaders understand the disadvantages of doing that, but supporting them in what they want to do. Um, and something really simple and practical is keeping a list of assumptions that they're making in the decisions that they're, they're, uh, that they're making as they move through the process quite rapidly. Um, one of the disadvantages being, do we have all the knowledge or wisdom that, that we need to in the room? Quite often with compliance-based change, the answer is no, because there is that uh, choice not to go further out into the organization to collect that wisdom and use that knowledge. So I know it seems uh, reasonably small and insignificant based on on what you described, Mark, as, as wisdoms. But my piece is having a list of those assumptions uh, and trying to test those assumptions as, as the leaders move through the process. And they can do that in a stealth way. Um, but if they ignore them, then I think that's where big risks start to, to occur when you come to implementing. I think your change work um, is quite dramatically different than if you were if you were doing something more proactive, Wilson, that um, was uh, more commitment based. And I think that's where you have to just be prepared to be uh, play both hats and know that um, and particularly as an internal, you know, which battles you take on, which ones you don't. And I think it's very important for you in terms of um, survival and uh, is, you know, obviously there's there's lines you won't cross as a practitioner, as a professional. Um, but I think it's important for you to know, OK, what's the situation here? What can I do to help? Um, there's no opportunity to influence that change. It's coming. How do we now get that in? All right, let's keep rocking and rolling. Um, this is really just a slide that summarizes the neuroscience that's built into our methodology. Um, um, and, and the neuroscience talked about uh, observed social fairness um, uh, is the same um, and, and respect when 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 we observe unfairness disrespect it's similar to actually experiencing pain physical pain so the importance of really understanding um, those though the behavior impacts on other people um, and translating that then into how do we do our change work uh, becomes really important um, the other one that I really love about neuroscience is, is that um, people in general have a positive boost to their neurotransmitters and, and their experience when they have some say over what it is that they, that, that, that they do at work. So giving them some influence is a real, um, is a real boost in a positive way to engagement and to the employee experience. I'm going to keep us moving on here. So, Chris, do you want to um, do you want to kind of go over some of this here, uh, and then um, and then we'll go into more detail. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to just pick out a couple of points, probably similar to the themes from that that we've um, followed so far. Um, you probably guess by now that I'm I'm a I'm a bit obsessed with the whole point of inclusion and collaboration. I go back I come back to the story around my manufacturing days of, you know, asking for people's input and involvements and opinions, and do people feel heard in the process? So um, there's something that I've really embraced and loved 
just in the first few projects I've been I've been involved with with on the market in my first three months is is point number two is um, you know not um, superficial brainstorming or um, I'm sure many people on this call have been involved earlier in their career in different types of jobs and you get the senior team or men, members of middle management that do like back to the floor days come out to the shops Sorry. see visible uh, store visits uh, site visits and there's this sort of essence of of wanting to be visible and i often wonder what happens to the information that they collect on those site visits and and interviews and things is it a publicity stunt or do they actually do something with it and for me that's the whole essence of inclusion and collaboration is you keep people involved and you go back and you let them know what you did with the information that you gave them even if they're not involved in the in the whole process so um, for me, keeping that picture integrated is, is, is pretty key. And I think the other thing is um, on number three, there is really starting with, with the strategy of this work. So in our um, OTM star model, Mark will come on to talk about it in a minute. We really, um, we really spend quite a significant amount of time taking um, what is sometimes an already written strategy for an organization and pulling it apart, not for our own benefit, but for the, for the team that's in the room from the client. I don't know how many people on this call have ever read a strategy document that's sometimes 12 pages long, sometimes 85 pages long, and how many times you get to the end of it and go, I'm still not entirely clear about what this means. And that's one of the benefits of starting, as we put there, that with the business model and the strategy is really breaking it down into its component parts. And what we start to do is, is draw out features of the future operating model and answer the question of so what. If we're going to make this statement, for example, that customers are at the heart of everything we do, what we do is spend quite a bit of time is really starting to understand. So what does that mean for our operating model? Um, those are probably the two, two big things yeah. I'd pick out there, Mark. One of um, one of our customers, we may nameless, currently has in their strategy about being an experience organization. And all and and so I'm going to say that and and um, but each of us, if I would ask you to project into that what you think that means in very practical terms, if we're an experience organization, um, and um, to Chris's point is words on a page. This is where I love the intersection of psycholinguistics and who we are as human beings with words, right? Because words have meaning um, and the, it's the meaning behind those words that becomes important. And so things like uh, the ex an experience based organization, like what does that really mean in practicality? And the importance of really understanding what that means to each person who has responsibility for making that strategy or that statement come alive becomes critical to this work. Um, and so this comes back then to the social sciences and psycholinguistics and how we operate as human beings. And I think if, if, there, if you're getting anything from us is, yes, we know what we're doing when it comes to the technical parts of an operating model, but none of this works if, we don't, if people aren't able to make it work. And that's, that's the, for us the bottom line. The other thing I'll want to share here is when we talk about integrated, comprehensive, and holistic, is we have a. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, we we have applied this in an agile water uh, agile software development style um, uh, sprints, as well as a traditional waterfall application, um, and and both it works very well in both scenarios. And and we'll come back to that if you have more questions. Comments, questions, reflections before we move forward. Any thoughts? Penny for your thoughts. No? Okay. So many of you, some of you have seen this before, is we have a uh, eight phase cycle um, um, that, uh, that repeats itself um, and particularly the contracting piece, which is more related to what we would call general consulting skills, internal consulting skills. And then uh, we also base it um, on Galbraith's original STAR model. And we've taken that STAR model and really put some rigor into it and defined each and what does it mean, what's involved and how do they all work together in parts and pieces. 
And I, I think as the basis as the headline is, this is our approach to this methodology. Now, let me highlight a couple things. If you look on the left side of your screen, each phase, um, uh, each phase um, has a set of concrete outputs that have to be achieved. Each phase is followed by approval gates. All of you know that everybody reports to somebody. You can't just go make a change in one part of the business and not have it impact other parts of the business. And again, uh, this comes back to Jilly's comments about limited leadership capacity, helping a leader understand that, hey, you might be in supply chain and you might have control of the people who report in supply chain, but you make a change of supply chain, you know you're gonna affect your demand and your sales and business development, and you know you're gonna impact manufacturing and distribution. So you better make sure that you're engaging those other parts, of, uh, other affected parts of the business in this process, which is why we have approval gates. Um, it's also built in critical pathing of decisions. There's certain decisions that have to be made first, second, third, it's very simple. Um, and of course, every phase allows for greater and greater involvement through the process. Um, if you look at the right hand side, each phase for us contains a purpose, the technical and, and psychological objectives, um, a set of tangible outputs, key decisions in the order that they need to be made, essential activities, change readiness work that has to be done or should be done, and then stakeholder, stakeholder review approval and decision gates. So every phase has these elements in it. Um, uh, Danelle, I want to call your attention to stabilization achieved. These would be traditional process measures, um, Danelle, and I'll go over these in just a second. But each of our phase, each of our phases plays a very important point in the in the actual design work. And and for those of you who've done this work with us, the design work, real substantive design work, doesn't really start to concept design and detail design. The current state review is all about lining up people to see, see the same thing that everybody else is seeing. So you're creating a movement in the current state review phase where all we do is look at the current operating model in relation to the current business model and ask the question, how fit for purpose are we doing? The foundation phase is about setting up the requirements just like you would for a new product. Um, what are, the, what are like a product set of requirements is what are the requirements, the parameters and the constraints of the future operating model? And one of the nuances, but important for you to see is the difference between current state review and foundation phase is what we call a traditional gap analysis. It tells you where you're at and it tells you where you're headed and you get a sense of how big the gap is between the two. Then leaders have a decision to make at the end of the foundation phases. Do we move on into the concept design phase or do we take another set of actions? Maybe we can just do some quick fixes. Um, the concept, let me highlight something. Once you go into concept design and if you're involving other people in that work, there's no going back. Um, sometimes leaders get scared and uh, they may be in the middle of concept design or detail design and they don't like what's being done and they stop it. It's happened twice in our 30 year career. Um, you have to guard against that because there's no there's no coming back from a, from the credibility of a leader um, to stop a design once they've involved people in that process and say, oh no, just kidding. There's just no psychological uh, recovery from that, from a credibility perspective. Um, transition planning is exactly what it sounds like. The concept design phase is the architect's rendering of a new operating model, the detailed design is the is the detailed blueprints which we build by including roles and jobs and management roles and jobs, technology, information flow. Transition planning is where you do your assignments. How are we going to assign people to new jobs? What's the transition to the new world? And of course, implementation in design work, there is no such thing as flipping the switch. 
um, and which is why we say it takes three to six months to stabilize, which means the change work has to be happening simultaneously throughout the stabilization phase. So you cannot take your foot off the gas pedal in the stabilization phase. So let's, let's for Danelle's sake, since you brought it up, Danelle, I'm going to um, let you see, ask if there, if any of these, if you want clarification on any of these, um, what we call process metrics towards stabilization. And you're on mute, Danelle, if you, uh, if you want to talk. Yeah, no, I was, I was reading um, through these. So, um, so on the 90% of the, or greater than of the jobs filled, is that kind of a kind of a combination where the jobs themselves are, are filled, but there also may be some call it upskilling or that that's part of it. So it's just looking at the, the jobs out of what you needed to fill in the redesign are now filled. Yeah, that's, that's really, that, that's another uh, really good point, Janelle. The 90% of jobs filled does not include the upskilling that has need is needed. In fact, could be another metric that you would put in place of, uh, I'm going to make this number up mm -hmm. just because it's easy. Let's say we had a thousand, we had a thousand people who were impacted by this and 500 we lifted and shifted because the jobs are the same, not much change. But let's say uh, 500, uh, we had to, uh, we had people interview and we filled most of them, but there's a handful of jobs that number one, we've had, we want to go outside the organization to fill because we don't have the skill sets in, yeah. uh, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other one is of those jobs that you've uh, had people who were in the organization now fill, have those jobs change, and what's the skill what's the skill development plan to upgrade to update them would be an entirely new metric okay. in addition to this that you'd want to track. Where are they in that development? How are they doing? Okay. Now one. The, go ahead, Chris. Just wanted to add the one point about um, how much of how much of the change impact that you might be able to foresee before you get to that stage in the process. Um, certainly with our method, we um, come right the way back to even foundation phase and concept design phase as we're starting to see the signs and signals of how much of the work in future is going to be brand new or significantly changed. We're already helping the client at that stage start to think about how are you going to manage that transition because you know there may well be a a lull in um, what I call a, a good idea, and then making it happen and and actually uh, maturing it to a point where it's actually doing what 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 you want it to do and and that's that's not what am I saying that that doesn't just happen at implementation of course we're starting to plan for that even as the idea is starting to germinate back in the uh, in, in the concept design. Yeah, Jilly, I'm thinking of some of the work we did with National Nuclear, and some of that work was totally new that had never been done before, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you have to think about, is that, can we, can we fill that with someone in-house? Um, how are we going to, how are we going to uh, uh, identify people who are, um, are able to take that job? Do we have to go external for that? How do we bring them up to speed? So all those things, Danelle, um, mm -hmm. are really important in your transition planning phase. You'll have a really good idea of that in the previous phase so that you don't wait to implementation um, to actually then discover that. So you you would know all those things in transition planning. Okay, good. Um, quick question on the glue mechanisms. Are, th are these looking at it more from a kind of a change perspective or like a change leadership enablement type of kind of some of the traditional things there, or is it something different? One of the things that we've bolstered in our in our methodology over the last couple of years is called the management operating system and, okay. and, and mechanisms. So the glue mechanisms are your vertical and horizontal mechanisms that both glue up the end-to-end -end work, it. as well as connects your strategy all the way down to your operational work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that includes team meetings and, and how our team impacts other teams and what's the glue mechanism that we're gonna use with that other team to make sure we're integrated and coordinating. Um, and so those mechanisms we track and we make sure that they're working. So old, old mechanisms are stopped, new mechanisms are put in place 
um, uh, it, a mechanism could even be like, uh, it's not uncommon uh, for when we do an enterprise to actually have the P&L shift from one part of the business to something else. So the P&L is, is both a, uh, is, is both a, uh, um, is a mechanism that needs to make sure that those get in place and is working. So, um, you know, you don't just basically hand somebody over a P&L to go from, well, it was in manufacturing and now it's in the front end called um, uh, business winning uh, market A. That's just not a, that's not just magic. So you're really tracking all of the things that have to happen in order to support that change in the operating model. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the wisdom here is, it's easy to move, it's not easy, but it's it's easiest to move people into jobs. That's really easy. It's all the other stuff around that. Jilly, you were gonna ask a question. Yeah, I was gonna ask a question about, because you made me think, you know, about the metric behind the metric. So, and I think you just nearly answered it, Mark, which was, you might fill the jobs with the people who are here, but then the dissatisfaction or satisfaction, depending on who the new leader is or what the new function is, whether they are happy with the new glue because they liked it the old way. So even if they've been involved, I almost think you have to give yourself a, a bit of freedom to say, well, we did what we set out to do. Um, because there will always be, a, particularly now with 30% of people moving. So there's, I, I guess there's a reality check behind it that says, don't, can we not beat ourselves up if we don't get 90% filled? Yeah, you can. And, and, um, and, and you might say, let's, let's shoot for 80% and that's good enough, but you know what the trade-offs are. And the key here is to be conscious and intentional about when you're in stabilization. The mm -hmm. thing to remember about jobs filled is you can't transfer work until there's somebody able to catch work. So let's, yeah. it's quite common that the way work is organized and bound um, changes quite dramatically in our redesigns. Mm -hmm. So whoever does that work today may not do that work tomorrow and it may be done by another role or job um, or it may be split up, but those jobs may not be filled yet. So I can't myself, um, my work, I can't push off, I can't give my work away and free up my capacity to take on the work that I need to be doing. So, so remember your jobs filled is direct, directly related to work transfer completed. Mark, I think there's something additional to that, that I'd offer uh, to your observation, um, Julie, which is uh, being mindful of trying to design something so perfect at the detailed design and transition phase that it fails first contact with those that do the work as you start to move the work over. So one thing that we intentionally do is, is um, we don't design any more than 75% of the work um, before those that are doing the work every day get involved, as in they start to operationalize the work. And what we try to say there is we allow that white space for the people that are responsible for delivering the work every day to have an opinion. Um, because they all will. We've all on this call been on the receiving end of change at some point where somebody says, we'd like you to do this part of your of a, of a new job as part of your role. And, and I think it's natural for everybody to have an opinion on it. So I think we should go into that with a view of giving people an opinion and trying not to um, design something too perfect. I'm going to keep us moving. Um, Danelle, this, these are some metrics, but these aren't the only. We're going to come back to that. We're not done with you on that one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. Yeah, you may be asked saying, okay, that's enough. I don't need any more. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, let, me, let me share with you uh, some other new additions into our integrated, comprehensive, and holistic. Um, these are some new job aids that we've, uh, that Jeremy, thank you, and, and the team have been working on uh, to basically pictorial, to create a picture of our work and how it all connects. So we have what's called the core of OTM's organization design solution, which is mostly about concept design work. But you can see that what we've done is enhance this by connecting the phases of work so that you can see which phases that work gets done. Um, second slide here, connection between demand, work, jobs, and people. 
And really, this is mostly detailed design work, but you can see all the things that need to be done. And we've added, um, we've really bolstered the management operation systems and, and mechanisms. Um, and then the last piece, which, um, which many times, most times get overlooked by de design work is the relationship between work decisions, roles and jobs, information flow, reporting, governance and technology. And um, we've been working on this for a while and basically to show the relationship between what we do early on is identify what is the value creating um, work that has to happen in the new operating model. What work do we stop, start, change? How do those, how does that work translate into roles and jobs? And then how do we take those roles and jobs and the technology that may be making decisions on that value creating work, um, which we treat as a role and translate that into information flow and data needs, um, management reporting, governance, and again, technology. Um, and, and so all of this work is what really locks in um, a, an operating model. It's not just enough to move people around on an org chart, because if you do that, none of these other things change. And so what happens is it puts people in a bit of a quandary. So it, for us, part of, the, uh, part of the equation around comprehensive is really working through the work system and making sure that the work system, uh, all the affected parts of a work system are addressed. Um, that Danielle, makes sense. Go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to come back to make sure that we fully exhaust Danelle's question from earlier on. Um, just on the topic of information flow here, um, there's a, there was a project that Mark mentioned earlier on. He sowed the seed. It's now germinating in my brain. Um, one of the, if we take the key strategic KPIs that they were looking at, one was to um, significantly reduce, and they had a number, but to significantly reduce the amount of people that entered their organization, so service-based organization, and reduce how many touch points they had around the organization. So they wanted to um, match the person's need or request to the service that they need right first time. And what they were finding in their existing operating model is, is, is these uh, customers were being bounced around the organization. So they weren't identifying the need early enough and it was taking them a long, long time. So quite a simple operational uh, uh, metric in terms of demand. The other side of that was really interesting, which was a new metric that the design process defined for them, which was they wanted to see up to 20% of customers before they came into the work, uh, it, before they came into the organization. So they wanted to preempt demand. And for that to happen, they needed to change the way that the front end of their business worked from a, from a data and from an automation perspective. They need to be integrated in with other organizations in their um, ecosystem, if you like. Uh, and that's just an example of, of how um, a really rich example about how actually that is translating into some human work, but an awful lot of um, work around uh, integrated data across a selection of organizations, not, not only their own. So just a couple of example KPIs. I've not been specific with the number, but hopefully some examples. So Danelle, um, just an FYI, typically the um, success metrics mm -hmm. um, uh, are identified in the foundation phase by the leadership team of saying 18 months to two years out, how will we know this effort's been successful? Um, and that's where you're going to get your traditional, our, 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 our annual costs are going to decrease by 10%. So it's not uncommon to say, we're going to keep our costs neutral. We're going to grow our business by X. Um, we're going to reduce our error rate. Um, our engagement scores are going to are going to increase by 10%. So it's those kinds of metrics that you would almost imagine um, uh, that that they use for other things um, that are typically identified in the foundation phase. Okay. It's it, it'll be your process measures that might shift or you'll have a whole a dashboard just with process measures. Number one about how the design's going. Are, you know, for example, stabilization, but also then how are we doing in moving towards the uh, impact measures that we're, we're setting up? Are, are people, is our engagement scores moving in the right direction? Are our customer satisfaction, is that improving? Um, 
So it'll change and vary, those metrics will change and vary somewhat business to business or project to project. Okay. Okay. Um, another example of integrated and comprehensive and holistic. Um, if you look here down at the bottom left hand side, one of the things that we do when we start a design project is we, we actually work with the, the customer to identify all the current or planned improvement projects that are going on and make a decision on those either to postpone, integrate, stop or continue, but watch. Because the design project is so, uh, is so encompassing. Many times there's lots of projects that are actually trying to fix um, that actually become unnecessary. So that project inventory is another way of us to be um, to be uh, systemic uh, to apply systems thinking and saying, okay, you've got finite resources. What what are continuing to invest in? For example, um, one of the projects had um, that we worked with one of the customers had seven different technology projects going on in the organization. So one of the things that we did is we unpacked the technology and said, what would it do differently once you put that in place? And that translated into a value stream and into work. And so we identified that work being done by technology as part of the value stream and then identified it as part of a role. So uh, it's very important that you know what all the moving parts are so that you're not working at at, at, uh, against each other, all the different parts of the organization. This is, these are just some other examples. The, um, sorry, I went a little forward on that. Chris, anything you want to say here um, before we move on? Um, I think only Mark to say that this, this is bringing to life what we were trying to describe earlier on as, as taking that whole system approach, whether it was the M&A example Mark used and that sometimes org design is its own separate work stream. What this is trying to do is to say whatever decision you make in a redesign it is going to be quite impactful across the whole organization. So having the ability, having the foresight to say, are there some projects there that we should pause and not ex not waste effort essentially and let's do it but what you know there's a wisdom here from from me which is sometimes when you start a redesign particularly if you use the word organization design it can mean different things to different people so when you're talking to somebody that leads the organization's change portfolio or it change and implementation they may have a perception that org design is just the hr thing that happens over there isn't it and it's worth um Sorry, we, we should build in time to have that education to get people on the same page quite early on. Yeah, or it's just structure, right? Just uh, right. help me. Uh, I, I need to uh, change some people around. So can you redesign that? So, yeah. Uh, and I just that... said the, the worst insight I've ever had was how did procurement know that we needed to do this? And where did they find on the mark? Say more, like... Jilly. So the people who were involved in it assumed that procurement would bring in org design and that it's a procurement discipline and that they'd identified the opportunity presented to the board, got the sign off and weren't procurement very clever. And we got absolutely no credit for it. I didn't take any, but it made me smile. <laughs> so just sharing it here to make me feel better. <laughs> Well, it is it is uh, it is one of those things, Jilly, where um, you know you're the change internal change agent, change agent and instigator, and um, and sometimes you just have to let it let it go and just and just find some find strength in in, in knowing. <laughs> Special KPI for that one, Danelle. How exactly. many insults to HR? <laughs> yeah, uh, Danelle, when your internal customers say to you, uh, "Well, we didn't need you anyway." Take that as a badge of honor. Okay. Um, and then ring me up for counseling. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, oh, okay. This is an example of, of kind of the level of involvement. Jilly, you'll recognize si back of Simon's head there. By the way, uh, uh, Simon is still with us, Jilly, just so you know. Um, right here, I win the bet. 
<laughs> I know neither one of us would have bet that. Anyway, this is an example. There's three or four examples here of um, uh, the pictures of how large, uh, how, how quickly uh, we can move through a redesign. And just to give you the give you some sense of scale, the fastest redesign we've ever done was from current state review into implementation in 32 days for a global um, for a global function. Um, and then um, and then for an enterprise was um, eight weeks. Um, for a global enterprise um, company out of San Francisco uh, was an eight week kind of moving pretty quickly. Um, so it, these things can move really, really quickly um, if, if there's the will. And, uh, uh, and I will share this with you. It is most amazing to me um, how the, the boldest redesigns that we've been involved with largely involve women leaders. It's not surprising to me. And I think it's, I, I think there's something more there that I've been germinating on, but uh, upon reflection, I just thought I'd put there, put that out there in terms of courage and strength. And it's quite something as I think about it. Um, all right, let's keep moving. Um, this is just another way that we kind of, uh, as I said, we can involve people in the design process. Another one is we never take our eye off the social uh, change as well as the technical change, and we believe they have to happen simultaneously. Um, and, um, and then again, the one thing I would add here is the bottom right hand side, the largest redesign workshop we've done is 500 people in a room over six days, moving through concept, detail and uh, design and transition planning. So you can see the kind of pace we can get um, around speed uh, when, when there's a whole lot of involvement. We probably spoke about it enough, Mark, already, but of course what's happening in the picture on the right-hand side is, you know, you might reduce down to, you know, uh, uh, only a couple of days to do the actual technical work. I, what I love about this is what's happening on the right hand side is people are going through that change journey simultaneously to doing the technical work. So when when we say 32 days to do the fastest uh, functional redesign to implementation, that's that's implementing it and people starting to do the new work. That's not 32 days of doing the technical work and then suddenly we, we've got to engage a whole bunch of people. Um, right. And it's quite magical to see. Uh, to, to see the, the work happen in such on such a large scale. And in the last two years, we've uh, since COVID onset, I mean, we've 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 done the similar work virtually, um, just using mural and and uh, and zoom. So in the last couple, I, I think one of the things that we want to highlight is uh, uh, for your consideration, a big decision is do we build and reinvent a org design solution? Do we buy it? I think we still see that happening out there quite a bit, um, trying to kind of build something. And I think, well, if you have the luxury of time, maybe you can build something or maybe you can buy it. Um, our solution, um, our solution now has face by face, uh, step by step methodology, tools and directions, templates with directions, um, completed work samples, how to guides. So, Julie, one of the things we've added quite a bit um, and are adding is the uh, ensuring we've got completed work samples, templates, and how-to guides for every every decision that needs to be made in the design process. Um, and um, lastly is we are um, putting to bed OTM's app, and we now are going to Canvas, um, which is an online uh, learning management system. Um, is anyone familiar with Canvas at all? It's used quite a bit by the universities um, in, in virtual um, uh, uh, teaching. Um, but basically what it allows us to do is, for example, um, Julie allows us to give your team entire access to the entire thing. But maybe let's say Wilson and his team only have uh, access to another limited part. And when we make updates, it allows us to update for everything uh, across um, and it's something that it's online um, and you just download um, digital elements in, into um, and they're there for your access. 
it was a big decision for us, but it was something I think uh, it was important for us to kind of consider all the options. Some of the re reasons why we chose to go to Canvas. Um, and I think all of you know that we can partner with you, we can do it for you, we can do it for you from behind the scenes, which we really find the skill building component. Really, a lot of companies find that quite attractive, which is teach us to fish uh, and, and be there to support us as we throw the rod and in the, in the line in the water to make sure we're doing it right. I think it's a, an observation that we've actually got as a team here at at OTM is an increasing interest in the whole concept of teach us how to fish and then, you know, enable us to do it for ourselves, particularly for next year. Um, you know, big, big trend for, um, for a lot of people. So, uh, which I think is, I come from a larger consulting firm, if I can say so, Mark, and, um, you know, selling your IP and selling your solution away to enable people to do it themselves isn't, isn't all that common. So, um, you know, one thing that we're really, really keen on is, is to, uh, help people with their inner genius and, and, and get on and do it for themselves in their own organization. So with that said, would you, uh, Reagan, would you like to um, either, if we have any other questions or comments, happy to take them, or would you like to close it up? Yeah, um, I'll just give everyone maybe a final pregnant pause in case anyone has any lasting thoughts or questions they wanna share. Um, and just a real quick, quick, go ahead, Jelly. Sorry. No, it's just thank you for the update. You're welcome, Jelly. It's good to see you, and I hope you're well. I'm interested in your next. Uh, in your next, you must be doing some innovation project, some building, something, right? Uh, in uh, exactly. So we have to have a, a catch up um, soon. Ramona, did you have anything to add? Yes, if I may. Um, I don't know if you can hear me yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, just one quick question. Um, how uh, have you worked with a, a not for profit for once? And did you come across um, um, any type of context where the governance, I mean, the, the legal framework that an organization has to go by? cannot be changed while they are in dire need for transformation. Yeah, uh, uh, Ramona, we actually have a project like that as we speak, so um, which has some similar dynamics. Um, we're doing mm -hmm. a redesign of a NHS in the UK. Which, okay. Um, and has some very similar kinds of things where some things can't be changed. So there's a lot of stakeholdering work going on about what can be changed and what can't be changed. We've also done work for um, the World Health Organization and some of the some of the contractors in there, for example, GAIN, a Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, nonprofit, mm -hmm. really different operating model, a lot of regulatory kind of uh, uh, things that are in place that can't be can't be changed. So uh, yes. Um, and and um, what we have found is um, and in that case, the leadership team has a lot of stakeholder work to be done about really identifying what can be changed versus um, versus what can be changed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it helps welcome. to know. It helps to know because the uh, the organization I currently work with um, is in the health public health system as well. So. Yeah, a lot of similarity with your NHS project, I would imagine. Yeah, a very strong center. Lots of dic lots of things are dictated. Job descriptions. You have to have this job title. Um, uh, yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, and, and transformation and change. I mean, what what you would actually feel as an organization you can do within your boundaries. Basically, when you talk about the foundation and everything, every brick in there is connected outside of the organization with very complex pieces of legislation right. that in order to switch and change, uh, it's going to take uh, another world of a universe of time. Ramona, just another side note, and I'll just give you, um, as you're talking about this, um, 
we did a redesign in the US for a state level child protective services. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they had over a, a hundred different state level and federal level laws and statutes impacting their value stream work that they had to be done. Um, and so we documented all of that and, and actually calculated the waste that that drove in the organization. And what they what ended up happening was uh, we came up with a new model. The the uh, that government agency got a reprieve from the governor to beta test a new way of working. And if they were successful um, mm -hmm. and they were successful, then they would get a re then they would look at uh, doing some new legislation to remove some of those challenges or to ch alter them. So it's it's uh, it, it comes back to the stakeholder involvement, which is everybody reports to somebody and the key becomes is uh, in making sure that um, all of the system is changing to support what it is you're trying to do, not just one part. Thank you. Quite not valuable. To, uh, Thank you. Not, Ramona, last quick point, not to sound naive to it, but every innovation starts somewhere. And in the NHS example Mark shares is you'd be amazed about how much uh, perceived uh, red tape was described in the room very early on in the project. And now suddenly there's a huge level of interest from a uh, regulator, other partners perspective about what's going on in that organization's redesign. So you never know. Yeah, I think, uh, and thank you for that as well, opening up the organization to the possibility mm -hmm. of asking themselves the what if. Well, and it's it's not us, it's the leaders in that business have an appetite to really want to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and they realize and they realize how burdened they are. Um, um, so anyway, it's it, for whatever that's worth. Thank you. You're welcome, Ramona. Um, Danelle, anything? No, I've got a lot to think about and start working through. So thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. And 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 reach back out. Danelle okay. will hear as a resource. So we're happy to okay. chat with you. It doesn't cost you anything except, you know, uh, time, which uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we all have a little bit of. All right. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. Uh, and Heather, um, Heather, I'm assuming you're calling us from San Francisco. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Gotcha. How, how did you know? <laughs> Uh, well, it was a, a LinkedIn uh, uh, by uh, association, and uh, I didn't think you were the Heather Sumter accountant, uh, so uh, I, I assumed you had to do more with uh, transformation work, so based on what your profile says. Got it. All right. Well, uh, good to meet you, quote unquote. Good, good to have you with us. Wilson, <laughs> always a pleasure, and Susan, if you're still with us, great. Great to, great to, great to know you're still around. Back to you, Reagan. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I certainly learned a fair amount. Um, and clearly Mark and Chris are just thorough experts at discussing these things um, and organization design and passionate and hopefully you can kind of see the passion that comes through. Um, so we will be providing this recording and the slides for those who joined and um, we have a full modernizing operating models collaboratively course, which is our organization design masterclass that will be taking place at the beginning of the new year in January. Um, it'll be running for five weeks and everyone will meet two times a week on Tuesday and Thursdays. So um, feel free to look into that, inquire. Um, we also have an event coming up with uh, the ODF, where we'll be discussing some work that we conducted with Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare, um, which was a hugely successful project, and the CEO will be there as well to discuss. So um, if you're interested in any of those, you know, visit our website, send me an email, we'll get you signed up, um, and hopefully we'll see you again in the near future. <laughs>